So let me ask you, do you move well, eat well, and sleep well? Do you feel that modern medicine is looking out for your best interest? Do you know how to take care of your body so you can stay pain-free and in the activities you love? Do you know what options you have? If not, that's a problem, and this podcast is the answer. I'm Trevor Folker, and welcome to the Green Bay Health Project Podcast. The Green Bay Health Project Podcast is sponsored by Movement Performance and Rehabilitation, where we help the athletes and active adults move better, perform better, stay pain-free, and in the sports and activities that they love. We do this by focusing on their movements and optimizing their mobility and strength. We believe that your body is your greatest tool, and when you take care of it, you can move better, you feel better, and you thrive. So head to movement-rehab.com, that's mvmt-rehab.com, to learn how we can help you stay active and pain-free. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to the Green Bay Health Project podcast. And today I am joined by Nick Patrick, who holds certifications in CrossFit Level 2 Trainer, CrossFit Movement and Mobility, CrossFit Gymnastics. He's a movement aficionado, and I'm excited to uh, have a conversation with him. So, Nick, thanks for uh, taking some time out and talking today. Hey, what's up, Trevor? Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I'm going to throw you on the hot seat uh, right away. Could Rose have fit Jack on the board in the water? Undeniably, (laughs) unequivocally, the answer is 1000% yes. It's the most selfish move in the history of mankind. Uh, Completely devastating. Um, Yeah, totally. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Weren't expecting that one. Um, That's a, that's a good way to kick it off. No, I completely agree. Anyways, let's uh, get into your background because I know it's uh, you kind of did some things before you kind of found uh, the gym. Well, not found the gym, but kind of what you're doing now uh, and what your role is. So I think it'll be interesting to hear the background and kind of how you came to be um, the head coach and director of training at True North. Yeah, for sure. So I guess a long story short, um, my whole life, I've identified myself as an athlete. I played sports my whole life. Um, I was always in a season or preparing for a season. And although I didn't have any aspirations of going pro in anything, I wasn't, you know, world class athlete. I still viewed myself much, very much as an athlete. Um, I really enjoyed the process of trying to get better for a particular sport or or season that was coming up. Um, I was fortunate enough to play five years of college basketball. And when my last season ended, it was, man, it was a hard stop. Um, suddenly I found myself um, without a, lo- a big sense of purpose, I guess you could say. I wasn't preparing for a season. My athletic career was quote unquote over. Um, so I was really just kind of wavering when my best friend introduced me to this thing called CrossFit. Um, up until then I was in the gym, you know, doing buys and tries and stuff like that. And he said, try this workout with me. And I looked at it on paper and I said, oh, uh, well, that's cool. What are we going to do after? And he just kind of looked at me and gave me a little smirk and we hit the workout and, you know, eight, nine minutes later, I'm flat on my back, looking up at the lights, like what just happened? (laughs) Toasted. (laughs) Posted, smoked, and I was hooked. Um, I hadn't pushed myself like that in months, um, and I was completely hooked. Um, So at that time, post-college, I was working at a local college in my hometown. Um, I had an office job, and then I also coached basketball. And I absolutely loved coaching basketball. You know, I was just coming off my final season, um, so I still had a lot of knowledge fresh in my mind. Um, but the thing that I didn't love was the desk, the desk job part of it. Um, mm-hmm. you know, while I worked with, you know, really cool people, um, great people, um, I, I just felt like, a, a, you know, like I was in a cage all day, um, not really fulfilling and using my skill set to the best of my abilities. And it just felt like I was 
not wasting a life, but wasting a lot of potential. So I sat down and I said, you know, what am I passionate about? Okay, I, I like coaching. I like hard work. Um, how can I make this my everyday life? So then I started looking into how do coaches get into CrossFit? Um, you know, you have to get your start out with your level one certification. So I researched, you know, how do I do that? I went and I did that. Um, and then I made the choice to quit my job. Um, it wasn't easy. Um, I'm not sure my parents were super excited about it. <laughs> um, but they understood that I wasn't happy and I needed to take a chance. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I started emailing places, telling my story, much like I just told you. Um, and I got a response from a gym in Green Bay. I came down here and visited and pretty much just dove in head first. Um, the first few years were sort of rocky um, for, for many reasons, but ultimately uh, I'm fortunate enough where I made it through the worst. I try to keep learning and I, you know, looking back, I'm not exactly sure how I got here today. Um, <laughs> it took a lot of help from a lot of people, um, but here we are. For sure. That's, that's awesome. And I'm like, you, you touched on a few different things that I think are pretty interesting. Like a lot of people, when they compete for a majority of their childhood into the teens, and then if they're lucky enough to play in college, you know, at some point that comes to an end. And a lot of people, I think, drop off at that point because they can't, they, they don't know where to turn or how to get back into that competitive atmosphere. And I think a lot of people identify like that or identify towards competitive sports. And when that's over, they, they don't know where to turn. So the fact that, I mean, your buddy turned you on to CrossFit and now it's led you all the way here, I think is, is huge. A lot of people are searching for that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, looking back, it really saved me. You know, I was still, I was still in my early twenties and I was at an age where I could have kind of a fork in the road, you know, I could have turned to the unhealthy lifestyle, you know, just sit at the desk, um, you know, bars on the weekends and, and all that. Um, luckily I was introduced to a different path. Um, and like I said, ultimately I'm just, I'm really lucky that I'm here. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, we could talk about our love for the Michigan Wolverines. <laughs> and our frustrations yeah. oh, too many frustrations <laughs> way too many um anyways so you're at you're at true north now and i mean i know that you preach movement mobility and i mean quality of movements a lot of people think you know just throw some weight around it doesn't matter how you beat up your body so what I really want to ask you is how you came to found that and, and what you or how you kind of direct your members and your clients that you work with to pick up some of that or the importance of just taking care of your body, moving well, like movement quality over, you know, poor lifting patterns and mechanics. Like how, how did you get into all of that? And then how do you work with your members on that stuff? Yeah, so the way that I got into it was basically break, sprain, and strain everything on my own body <laughs> and then figure out how to come back from that, but also d diving deeper into why that happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've had a couple of surgeries uh, in my past, a couple of significant injuries, um, and I would sit down and I'd say, okay, this happened, but why did it happen and how can I prevent that from happening again? So just learning about my own injuries kind of sent me down into a rabbit hole of, of learning and developing. And then I would take what I learned and then try my best to prevent it from happening to our members or people that I train. Um, what I, through all of my, you know, research, it's, it's rarely the catastrophic event that 
sends people into injury, it's, it's usually a series of events that lead you to the last stage where, okay, pop, it finally, mm -hmm. it finally went. Um, sure. An example that I really like and I think about daily is if you have two airplanes taking off from, say, New York and they're headed towards the, the West Coast, if those planes each are dialed just a half a degree in the opposite directions, by the time those planes get to the West Coast, one would be in Northern California and one would be in Southern California. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a huge navigational error. It was, say, half a degree. But over the course of thousands of miles, it led those planes in very different directions. And I feel that's how the body works where if you give your body just very small doses, little drips of improper movement or compensations, by the time the plane reaches the West Coast or by the time your body has had enough, it reaches a point where it just can't take it. And that's why I feel really strongly about preaching to our members the importance of proper movement and mechanics because it really is everything, especially when you're adding in factors like speed, um, weight, um, those are all variables that, especially at True North, we feel like you have to earn and your body needs to be ready to accept that or else it's just a matter of time before you start feeling symptoms of, hey, something's not right. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, piggybacking off of that, it's, you know, I've, I view things like there's, there's three different steps right you you're doing a workout you feel just say i don't know you're you're feeling something in your shoulders you're kind of like ah oh, that that hurt a little bit but i'm gonna shake it off and we'll see what happens it feel it probably feels good the next day but a couple weeks go by you do something else you're like oh man that still it's still bothering me with this specific movement or this lift but i'm just gonna keep pushing through and then it starts to linger and last for a few days you know a couple weeks but you still keep pushing, you still keep pushing. And at, at some point, that's when the injury really hits you, you know, and then, and then you're out. I mean, if you wait that long without taking care of it, you're out. And it, that all those prior steps where your body trying to tell you like, Hey, something's off, you're not doing something right. Or we need to improve our mobility or some of these movements, but you just ignore it, you ignore it. And then eventually you're screwed because then you're out and you're dealing with this thing that could have either been prevented or it could have been attacked much earlier during the entire process or phase and been taken care of to where you wouldn't even have to deal with it at that point. hundred you percent. Know? And you know, I, I hear it a lot, uh, you know, about a lot of different movements, but I think what I've heard it the most is I hurt my back deadlifting and yeah. I always, and I always hear that statement and my eye starts to twitch a little bit and I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to sympathize with the person who's in back pain at the moment. And, but inside my head, I'm like, did you, you know, right. it's, it's rarely that one specific rep that finally caused your back to tweak. It's, it's a many factors, you know, I haven't been sleeping well. I haven't been hydrating well. I haven't properly warmed up or cooled down. I haven't done my mobility. Um, my hip has been tight and I know it's been tight, but I've just ignored all of the signs and signals. Um, you know, I've sat for eight hours and then I went to the gym trying to be athletic, pulling a deadlift and pop, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the signs are usually there. We just have to know what we're looking for uh, ahead of time. For sure, and that poor deadlift, man it got it has such a bad rep <laughs> like people are told not to do it when really it's one of the best things i mean in my opinion and i'm sure you agree that you can do for your back i mean in terms of health and strength and just full body function that that lift it, it does it all and it just it's, people avoid it because they think they hurt their back doing it when like you said there was likely a bunch of other stuff going on and the deadlift it just happened to you f felt it more while you were deadlifting, so you attribute it to that deadlift. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could you the same, the same type of injury could just as well happen at the grocery store, bending over for the at the bottom shelf. Right, and people, I don't think people realize how often they're doing these movement patterns 
throughout the day. You know, you th I think of the squ a squat. People are picking stuff up off the ground. I mean, that's a deadlift and it's a squat and they're doing this and that. They're picking up stuff outside, picking up their kids, doing anything, but it's all the patterns. And if you do a pattern wrong thousands of times per day, how can you attribute it to one specific instance during a 45 minute workout? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, those are, those are hundreds and hundreds of repetitions that if done correctly throughout the day, really set you up for success. But if they're done incorrectly, you know, those are basically hours and hours more of training in the wrong fashion. Um, and that's, I mean, those, those are the reps that equate to the half a degree that the airplane is traveling exactly. towards the West Coast. You know, um, we don't notice it in real time that we're, we're bending over instead of hinging until mm -hmm. we can't bend over anymore because we're, we have a hard stop because of injury. For sure. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I like that airplane scenario. I had never, I had never heard that analogy, but that it, it's spot on. So when, when you have new members, um, I know that you guys put them through, uh, kind of, uh, at the training, I guess you could say. And I think that's really unique and it's really important, but can you talk about the kind of things that you look for when you're working with them one-on-one -on -one and um, some of the movement, I guess, inefficient patterns that you'll see and how, I mean, in your opinion, what you can do to correct it or what your, what even your um, way of improving your mobility and movement patterns, what's your routine and all of that? Yeah, so we go through a, we call it prep course at True North Performance where Athletes will come in and I'll teach them all the foundational movements that they would see in a traditional workout that we go about. And as I'm teaching those movements, I really start to study the athlete and watch how they move. And the value of that is it's just enormous where we can make changes in real time to their movement and get them moving properly right from the start. And I like, I really like our approach is because we empower the athlete. We give them the why, Hey, I'm going to have you adjust this in your squat. And this is why, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, if we just tell people, if we just give people commands, like do this, do this, you know, they might not care. You know, they're, they're looking for a workout. Um, they're not trying to be perfect, but if we can give them the whys behind why we're asking them to do what we're asking them to do, um, it's just, it's very beneficial for them as an athlete gaining awareness of, for example, where their body is in space. Like mm -hmm. I'm at the bottom of my squat. Okay. I should feel my knees pushed out. Oh, now I can start to connect that feeling to my brain. Um, mm -hmm. and before, you know, just with a few reps, they've adapted and they're already starting to move better. Um, mm -hmm. the other thing is we, while watching them move, we can start to identify, some mobility restrictions they may have. And then again, empower them with certain mobilizations, you know, soft tissue work, um, some banded joint mobilizations to clear up some restrictions. And again, after we have them do that for one, two minutes, they can feel in real time, like, wow, I can stand up straight and my hip isn't super tight. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have them. If you can, yeah, if, we, if we can get athletes to feel what it feels like to feel better, the sky is the limit. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people just go through the day, not even realizing that they're maybe operating or feeling only like 70% as good as they could. And what we do is we show them, Hey, this is what like 90, 95% feels like you could live here. And this is, this is what you'll do to get there. Mm -hmm. I think a lot, I think a lot of people are shocked at how far minor tweaks or corrections can go in regards to their health and how well they move. Um, they, I think a lot of, for some reason, people think it's this huge process or undertaking and they don't realize how, badly the body wants to move well and how quickly it'll adapt with certain cues and just basically what you feed it. So like you were saying, those, those one-on-one -on -one things are just, they're invaluable. 
and the cues that you're able to give them in real time and then they can feel that turnaround within usually a minute or two is huge yeah one of the best quotes i ever heard was the body is an adaptation machine and it, it's 100 percent true you know you think about you know you're, you're driving on a road trip you're sitting in the car for two or three hours you stop at the gas station you get out of the car and the the noises you make are just like oh oh man <laughs> it takes you like six seconds to stand up you know into the parking lot your hips have already adapted to a shortened position just in two hours mm -hmm. you know and that's that's a great example of your body as an adaptation machine um, and when it comes to mobility certain mobilizations that we do with our athletes literally take one to two minutes and the body will already adapt just over the course of 60 to 120 seconds it's it's truly amazing um, the body is from the day you're born until your very last day it is always trying to adapt and heal you just have to give it the correct input for sure it it wants that environment it wants it wants to take care of you but you have to basically take care of it at the same time i mean unless you're taking care of your body you, you can't ask it to take care of you without you taking care of it it's a it's basically a partnership i mean if, if you really think about it what what you feed it it's going to take so whether you're feeding it crap and you're moving poorly you're eating bad you're sleeping like shit, uh it's going to basically say okay well you're not treating me well so you're going to deal with these aches and pains but on, on the other side of it if you're doing these mobility drills you're eating good you you know getting good sleep it's going to respond and it's going to respond very quickly yeah i think a lot of people feel like the task to feeling better is is a really daunting one and like you just said it's it's not that daunting if you just eat the elephant and how do you eat the elephant one bite at a time um, you don't have to perfect everything at once i i I always say pick one thing get pretty good at it address one issue and then move on to the next that's that's a sustainable plan that will set you up for success rather than compiling a list of hey these are the 20 things that i need to fix and i'm just going to tackle them all if you try to do all of them you'll likely do none of them and you'll be burnt out and that'll be it for sure and that's I think that's the biggest issue or, you know, people want to start and they start, but as fast as it took them to start, it usually takes, they usually quit just as fast because they start to think, oh, I'm moving bad. Um, I can't, I can't perform like everybody else is during the workouts and I have to eat well, I have to sleep. I need to do this and that. And it's, it's just too much. So the fact that you break it down and you say, Hey, why don't you work on your squat for the next few weeks? You know, let's, let's open up the hips. Let's get you moving a little bit better and let's perfect the squat. And then all of a sudden they build some confidence and then they start, they start feeling better first of all, which then gives them confidence. And then they go into the gym, they're performing a little better. They're seeing some changes usually in the weight and just the way they feel. And then it's just a, a domino effect. They, it just, one thing builds off of the next. And, you know, I'm sure you see that all the time with, with the people you work with. Yeah, it really happens fairly quickly and me personally I always start with mobility because if if the body is physically unable to get into a certain position there's not a cue that I can use as a coach that's going to get you into that position it'd be like asking me to go outside and you know run the 100 meter sprint in nine seconds I physically can't do that no matter what you tell me to do what technique you give me I can't do it but once we open up those mobility restrictions, then we have more movement options. Uh, we can increase loading, we can increase speed, your performance will be better, better performance equals better results. Um, mm -hmm. But that's really, that, that is a barrier to entry. Um, you know, one of the things coaching CrossFit as, as a fitness mo uh, methodology is people see like, the, for example, the butterfly pull up, um, it's the, kind of CrossFit created this, this pull up where you use your body as momentum and you can rep out more pull ups quicker. Mm -hmm. 
that's the shining star. That's what everybody wants to do. But to do that, you have to have full range of motion through the shoulder. You have to have stability through the shoulder, strength through the shoulder. If you don't have the requisite mobility to get there, it's not a question of if, but when you're going to hurt your shoulder. Um, so that's why mobility is, is always step one um, for us at least. Yeah. So what kind of, so we'll, we'll just keep going off of that example. Um, you have somebody that can't necessarily do it. You pick some things out, which is we'll, we'll get to it, but it's probably the biggest benefit of working with a coach. But when you see that, what would, for example, be some, some work that you would say, Hey, let's try this and that in regards to mobility, you know, some band and mobs, uh, what, what does that look like? And, and how do the members usually respond to that stuff? So it's, it's not I, going back to, I think a lot of people think that their mobility restrictions are just this big daunting task, but once they're introduced to the, the few steps that it takes to open up restrictions, they're like, wow, that's all I have to do is, you know, two minutes of a banded joint mobilization, or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I put a lacrosse ball on the back of my shoulder, move my hand back and forth for two minutes. Um, that's all it takes. And I say, yeah, that's all it takes. Um, treat mobilizations like you do brushing your teeth. You wake up in the morning and it's just something you do. Just make it a part of your day and it's not this big daunting task. Um, so we like, to, we like to incorporate lacrosse balls for soft tissue work. Uh, we love bands for joint mobilizations. And we like that because after just a two minute dose, again, people in real time can put both arms over their head the arm they mobilized goes straight up in the air, you know, and their other arm is bent out to the side, stuck in one position. Um, so those are some of the, that's some of the mobility work we do. You know, we like to work with foam rollers and um, I think having a coach walk the athletes through those mobilizations is key because when I drop in at other gyms, you know, I'll see people grab a foam roller run it up and down their back for 10 seconds and be like, Oh, okay, well I'm good. <laughs> and I'm kind of looking out the corner of my eye, like you did next to nothing. <laughs> like you accomplished. <laughs> nothing. Um, so I, I think a lot of the times people don't exactly know how to do the mobilizations or what the most effective way to use a foam roller might be or a lacrosse ball. So having a coach there to show them, Hey, this is the way that's huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's definitely a right and wrong way to do all of that stuff. And if you're not doing it correctly, you, you may as well not be doing it at all. And that's where that that coaching really comes into play, because you can educate, you can show. And then, like you said, it does. It's not this huge, daunting task. It literally you can see changes if you're consistent with it, doing five to ten minutes every day. It's really all that it takes. And I think people again, get overwhelmed with some things when if they just take a step back and be like, start in small increments, but it's consistency. I mean, the consistency is where it's at. Yeah, and, I mean, I you, mean, you, you, you hit it on the head that? right there. The word is consistency. What you do more times than not, that's who you are, mm -hmm. right? So if you just make, if you just adopt a habit of, hey, you know, this is what I do before I work out, I dedicate, five to 10 minutes for mobility, that's just what I do, then it just becomes a part of who you are. Mm -hmm. For sure. So what's a, uh, let's let's get some examples. What's a typical mobility warm up thing look like for you? What's a routine that, that you found to work on any given day? Like what, do you have any like three, four or five drills you do, mobility stuff you do daily or is it switched every day or what, what's the typical routine? for Nick? Yeah, so I always start out with blood flow. Um, way back when, I can't remember where I read it, but th the statistic kind of jumped out and was pretty alarming to me that, you know, at rest, 80% of your body's blood is stored within the organs and only 20% is flowing throughout the muscles. So warming up is just elevating your core temperature, you know, five minutes of biking, jogging, jumping rope, whatever just warming your body a little bit 
pushes all that blood out of the organs and into the muscle. And that's always step one. Um, step two is usually looking at, you know, what am I about to do for exercise that day and making sure my body can get into those positions without weight. Um, so for example, if I'm going to do any type of overhead pressing, I need to make sure that I can lift my arms over my head and get my biceps by my ears. And if I'm a little bit short, okay, let's grab a band. Let's start to work on the shoulders a little bit just to get that range of motion. Um, if I'm going to do, if I'm going to be squatting that day, I need to make sure that I can sit comfortably into the bottom of the squat before I grab a barbell or do any type of warm up sets. So I might do a, a, a quick hip spin up with a band. Um, if I'm feeling, you know, tight in one area, I could grab a lacrosse ball and do some quick soft tissue work. Again, just one to two minutes. That's all it takes. Um, and then from there, I do, I like to do a lot of warm up sets with an empty barbell or just with body weight, just to really prime, prime the body, grease the grooves to get ready for what I'm about to, to, to hit. So it's, it's blood flow. It's make sure I can get into the positions. And then I would say, I would call it skill work where I'm doing empty bar work or body weight work, just prepping the body to move the way I need it to move. Nice. You, you kind of touched on something else I, I wanted to ask you about or bring up. So a lot of Olympic lifting and CrossFit style stuff ends in some type of squat, you know, what, and there's a certain time frame that people, a lot of people are sp spending time seated in a seated position all day, driving, working, doing this or that it, it's seated. And a lot of times, like you were saying, things are tight, you're not moving around. So the joints aren't kind of flowing. How could somebody improve their, their squat? I mean, is it just sitting in a squat for X amount of minutes per day? Would that be, would they get improvement with that? Or what would you recommend if they just simply wanted to improve their squat technique? When it comes to squatting, um, I Kelly Starrett is kind of world renowned. Um, you know, it's okay to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Um, mm -hmm. He he always talks about mobilizing the positions that you want to be good at, right? So if I want to be good at a squat, I need to spend time squatting, right? So if you think about a traditional day in the gym you really only spend a few seconds in the bottom of your squat. You know, it's down and then it's quickly up. Um, so if you want to get a better looking squat, we need to do things that look like the bottom position of a squat, whether that's um, sitting in the bottom of a squat, watching TV for five to 10 minutes daily, um, letting the hips open up. Um, I'm a big fan of banded joint mobilizations. So we call it kind of the Spider-Man um, position where we have a lateral band hip distraction and it looks like a single leg squat. And then we spend two minutes there just working to different end ranges. Just those two minute doses in a position that you're trying to improve, mm -hmm. get you where you want to go very quickly. Again, your body, your body wants to be better. You just have to give it the input to do so. Yeah. And I mean, sitting in that squat for five to 10 minutes, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be consistent, like straight five to 10 minutes because people are going to hear that and be like, wow, I, there's no way it's increments. Again, everything goes back to increments and just being consistent with it. But each time challenge yourself a little more to spend maybe just another extra 10 seconds than you did the day before. And once you're able to get in that squat, you're going to be like, oh, hey, my ankle's a little restricted or my hips a little bit more restricted today than it was yesterday. And then you spend time in the squat and then you follow that up with some of those specific band and mobs that you were talking about, or even some soft tissue work with um, lacrosse smashing and, and doing all of that stuff. And within a week or two, you'll be in the bottom of a squat much longer than you were just 14 days ago. You know, it, it's quick. Yeah. And I think you hit on something really important too is, a lot of these mobiliz mobilizations just start to really empower the athlete to have a, an understanding of what their body is, is telling them. So if you're spending 
if you aspire to sit in the bottom of a squat for five minutes, your body is going to tell you quickly where you're tight. Um, like, hey, we're down in this rock bottom squat. I don't like what I'm feeling in my, say, for example, right lower back. My right hip is super tight. Well, now you have something that you can specifically target to clean up. Um, you know, or for, you know, you're in the bottom of that squat and your back is getting tight. Okay. I need a little bit more safe mid back mobility. Um, right. a lot of these mobilizations are great diagnostics to, to give you a look under the hood of what exactly is going on. For sure. And that's, that's it exactly is it's almost the, the movement becomes the test and then you go from there. That's, I mean, we use that. I know you guys use that because there are so many different mo things that ways that you can move to feel things in different area. Like if you're in the bottom of the squat and you're thinking, then you try to lift your arms overhead, you know, your shoulders might move well, but you're like, Oh man, my, my T spine, my mid back is a little tight today. I need to go work on that. I mean, people need to realize the entire body is intertwined. It's all connected. You can't work on one area without addressing another, or you might be having some issue in your shoulder. But if you sit down in a squat or you sit down in a specific movement, you're going to realize, well, the pain's in the shoulder, but it's actually this restriction in say, I don't know if, if it's your right shoulder, say it's your left hip that's causing the problem. You know, it, you start to identify some of those factors by using the movement as your diagnostics. Absolutely. I, you, you nailed it. I, I view the, the gym as a, as a laboratory. Um, it's, it's a place where we can solve problems. We can see problems before they even start just by watching people and how they move. Um, it's movement is really the, the best way to predict what's going to happen in the future. And the thing that I like to, to stress and I, the thing that I see the most is a lot of people don't care, which is, this sounds crazy. They, they don't care about mobility in terms of injury prevention. Right. Prevention is not sexy. Um, you know, it's like insurance. We have it, but we have it, but we don't right. like it, but we really right. like it when we need it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I like to explain to athletes that, okay, instead of trying to convince you that this is important for injury prevention, how about performance? That's something that everybody likes. Like right? we like killing it in the gym. We like the results that come with it and we like feeling good. So, if you just do A, B, and C for two minutes a day, boom, your performance is going to skyrocket. Your results are going to be fantastic and you're going to feel good. That's something that they're going to care about. Yeah. And when they start to see those changes and that's, that's where it really comes into play is they start to see those changes then, and then they're completely bought in. You know, it's, it's pretty fun to see that kind of transformation where they're a little hesitant at first where they're like, eh, how is that? how is it really that easy or how is it really that only that amount of time and then they do it and they do it day in and day out and they come back to the gym they're like oh wow this is actually working <laughs> like yeah like well, you're some miracle worker <laughs> exactly it the you know through all my experiences the the work is actually the easy part mm -hmm. sometimes it's the untangling or sticking to the process that's the hard part and what i would say to that is seek someone who knows what they're looking for so for example me um it's very important for me to work with physical therapists because a lot of the problems that a that i encounter as you know i still would call myself an athlete even though i'm not competitive in anything um those are movement problems and movement problems require movement specialists, right? You know, I don't, I don't go get my haircut at the same place that changes the oil in my truck. Um, so I always seek out someone who a knows movement and knows how to fix movement imbalances or movement problems. Um, that's something that's, that's mission critical. Yeah. And Co I mean, coaches need coaches, you know, everybody needs an eye on them and the coaches are looking out for their members and they're getting that one on one time. But coaches need somebody looking at their back, too, because, you know, you can start doing something 
that you're not even aware about and somebody else a different set of eyes is going to pick up on it and be like hey man did you like know this was happening or did you know this was kind of going on and let, let's let's start working on it so it doesn't become a bigger issue it's everything it's throughout this whole COVID-19 pandemic you know we've all kind of been secluded a little bit so I have a little a setup in my garage so i been training primarily by myself in my garage left my own demise and while I am a coach and not necessarily have been doing things that were irresponsible again it's those little micro traumas mm -hmm. that send the plane to Northern California instead of Southern California and over the course of many months just a very possibly subtle movement faults certain things have popped up for myself because I'm not training with a coach that's watching my technique. And that's why having a coach, um, having a good coach, I should say, mm -hmm. is, is very important. Um, it's, it's alarming to me. You know, we have members that start at the gym and I'll assess their air squat. And I'm like, oh, wow, like some stuff going on there. Mm -hmm. And I explain to them like, hey, this is what we're gonna do and here's why we're gonna do it. And they're gonna say, wow, nobody's ever told me that before. And then I say, well, how many years were you at that other gym? And they're like, well, right. you know, four. And I'm like, over the course of four years, nobody's addressed like how to squat properly. Like um, it's, it's alarming, but you'd be surprised at how many times that same story gets told. Um, so every, I, I feel everyone should have a coach and coaches should also have coaches. For sure. I, I completely agree with that. It, it's, incredibly valuable to have another set of eyes looking at you. I mean, I was in by you guys and I was doing a, uh, this was a few months ago, I think, but I mean, just a single leg dumbbell RDL. And Kelly was like, Hey Trevor, you're twisting at the hip a little bit. Like you're opening up a little more rather than being straight out. And I was like, huh, I didn't even realize that. And sure enough, you know, I looked at it a little bit later on in the night and it was like, Oh man, no, no wonder I was doing that. My hips are super locked up. And, you know, I, it was something I sh probably should have felt, but I didn't because it was, it was pretty minor. But having that set of eyes looking at me, looking specifically for how I was moving during my workout, she probably caught that where, you know, had, had she not, I might have kept doing that and ended up with some, with some kind of back issue, likely. Totally. And, you know, I'll use Kelly as an example. Um, because of our similar schedules, Kelly and I pre- COVID-19 would work out a lot together and God bless her. She, I asked her, you know, hold me accountable. And, you know, she would tell me like, Hey, you're doing this. And, you know, the competitor in me would get angry and be like, yeah, right. No, I'm not. Right. You know, and then she'll shoot a video and show me, yeah, you are doing this. And it's, mm -hmm. I can't think of, I mean, countless tweaks, sprains, whatever she saved me from just from telling me, Hey, this is what you're doing. Um, you could probably clean that up right now. And it's mm -hmm. just incredibly valuable. Yeah. And, and you know, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, taking video also is a super easy way that you can identify some things. Like if, if you're not feeling confident in some, or if somebody's ever being like, Hey, I think this is going on and they try to refute it or, or battle it. Just take a video, take a quick video from the back side and front and there's no more proof than that because the video won't lie and it actually shows quite a bit. So if you don't have that second set of eyes, like if, if you're like, man, I'm working out by myself, I can't tell, set up a phone, set, set something up, take it, take a video shot, slow it down, watch it back a few times and see how you're moving. And then if it's not well, reach out to somebody that specializes in, in that movement stuff. Yeah, the, the video certainly doesn't lie. I mean, I've been in situations before where you know, I get it. You know, I'm coaching a class and there's a, there's an athlete that's working extremely hard. Um, and I give them a, a movement correction and they look at me like, like I'm crazy. Like, no, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. And I always say, who could you trust more? The coach who has a resting heart rate or the athlete, you know, who's maybe upside down doing handstand pushups with the heart rate at 160. You know, <laughs> right. who's, who's probably, you know, seeing things more clearly. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, always, always trust the coach and, and seek a good coach. 
that's that's the biggest part is seek a good coach find somebody that you can relate to and somebody that that truly has your uh, your best interests in mind and just wants to help i mean i understand you're in the heat of the workout heat heat of whatever your competitive activity you're doing you don't want to be told that hey you're doing this a little wrong let's make this slight adjustment but it, it's important to note that like you just said the coach they're at rest they're not competing they're not heavy into a workout they can pick up on some things that you cannot always feel and that is incredibly important for for people to understand that it's that you're just looking out for the for the good of their health in, in the long run like that's all all that it comes down to yeah i mean that's what it is i mean if i'm if i'm coaching a 60 minute class and i don't give each person one or two cues i'm not i'm not doing my job because mm -hmm. nobody goes throughout a 60 minute class and does every single repetition perfectly. So for me as, as a coach to, to do, to basically provide the service that I'm supposed to provide, I do need to give feedback, whether it's, you know, if they want to hear it or not, it's all designed to, to move, help them move better, keep them safe. Um, there's, you know, I'm not trying to tear anybody down. Um, it's all in the name of movement and, and helping people. I mean, that's at the, at the end of the day, um, we're just trying to get fit. You know, we're not trying to win the CrossFit games. We're just trying to, to move the needle just a little bit more forward than it was before. That's awesome. That, I think that's a, that's awesome. There's no need to say <laughs> anything else. Let's get into the, uh, the questions then, because honestly, that was a perfect ending to this. Um, so what's one of your favorite health related books? I, I know you got to pick one, man, <laughs> uh, well, even though you're not much of a reader, right? Front yeah, to back, it's, at least it's cover to cover. Be I've only read like four <laughs> books my whole life. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, just um, well, I'd say, although we're asking for one, I would kind of separate this. I have, I have two, um, but both, okay. both are related to mindset and, and the power of the mind. Um, when I was in college, um, pr probably the only book that I actually read in college <laughs> was called Mind Gym and it's by Gary Mack and it's basically the athlete's guide um, to inner excellence I would say um, he talks a lot about the power of the mind and the words that you use can increase your performance or your just general outlook on the day or completely blunt it um, mm -hmm. I was a basketball player and first four years of college, you know, had fun, you know, solid. Um, going into my final year, I read the book and the example that he uses is when you go say to, to take a shot, if your mind thinks don't miss, the only thing that your mind is actually going to pick up is miss, right? Mm. Um, so me personally, I was like, okay, how can I, how can I, just tweak how my mind thinks. So as, as I'm elevating to take my next shot, I started to think in, 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 or money. And mm -hmm. my three point percentage skyrocketed and I was amazed and it wasn't these big technical changes. It wasn't, I was putting more time in the gym. It was my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a very athlete specific, sports specific book that I thought was incredible. Um, and then post-college, um, there's a book called Chasing Excellence by Ben Bergeron, uh, you know, like the CrossFit coach, world renowned. Um, and his book, again, talks a lot about mindset and the power of the mind. And he has some examples of how this can kind of help you in competition, but also in life. Um, you know, if you wake up in the morning and your first thought is doom and gloom, your whole day is probably going to be doom and gloom or some degree mm -hmm. of it. Whereas sure. if you wake up in the morning and you say, well, all right, I'm, I'm going to give this day everything that I have. Um, you'd be surprised at how well your days could go, how well your workouts could go. Um, whether you're feeling good, bad, or otherwise, um, it doesn't matter, especially on the days where you don't feel that good. Give what you got, and that's one of my one of my favorite 
sayings is, you know, I'm a little bit tired. I didn't sleep well. Okay. I need to accept that I'm, I might not function at a hundred percent, but I have 80% to give and that's what I'm going to give. Whether it's during a workout, whether it's at work or with relationships, um, give what you got. And you'd be surprised at how that little mindset tweak can really brighten up your day. Everything always comes back to the mind. I, I read something at one point where it was, you know, a lot of people do things based off of how they feel and feelings and emotion and your emotions are going to, that's a roller coaster throughout the day. So if you pick what activity or what you're going to do based on how you feel at any given time of the day, you're likely not going to get anything done. It's, it, it, you can't ride that wave. It's just do it anyways or do it in spite of how you feel because usually especially in regards to work workouts and i mean things you enjoy doing you're going to walk away feeling much better than you did the hour before you you even started it, it's it's incredible yeah absolutely i you know i don't want to sound like a the impersonal dead-eyed person but you know i find myself throughout the day telling myself the feelings don't matter mm -hmm. like what you're feeling right now does not matter because ultimately you always have two choices. You can stop or you can keep going, whether it's during a difficult workout, um, a difficult time in your life. You always have the same two choices, stop or continue. Um, but just not letting the feelings mm -hmm. take over what you're doing is so huge. I know we're both fans of Jocko Willink and mm -hmm. his thing is he always tells himself good. You know, if he's really oh, struggling right. through something and his mind is telling him stop, stop, stop. All he says is good. You know, this is another, <laughs> this is another opportunity to fight, to get better. This is right where you want to be. I mean, he always mm -hmm. has a choice of quitting or put your head down keep going because that feeling isn't going to get you where you want to go most likely. Yeah, that's great. Listen, if, if, if you haven't watched the YouTube video of Jocko's good, highly recommend, highly recommend. Um, so what's your favorite health related related activity to do in uh, green Bay? Yeah. So when it's not 50 below zero, um, I really <laughs> enjoy going to Meadowbrook park and Howard, um, hmm. depending on the day and what I'm looking to achieve, um, the, that particular park has a lot of options. If it's a day where, you know, I just want to get out and walk for an hour, clear my head, move some blood, put on a podcast. It's got a ton of really good walking routes. Um, the scenery is really cool. There's a couple creeks that go through there in a little wooded area. Um, if it's a day where I'm kind of looking to get after it, they have a hill. Um, and it's amazing how much you can do with the hill. Um, I think one of the things that I learned throughout COVID is not having access to certain places that I would always have access to or certain equipment is, man, you can get by and you can do a lot with a little. Um, mm -hmm. There's a really cool hill there. There's, um, there's a playground that you can also incorporate awesome workouts. Um, so it's very, it's really versatile. Um, it's a really versatile place. I like being outside, especially in the summer. Um, and it's just, a, it's a good place just to go and clear the head. Awesome. And last question, what's one piece of advice that you would give to help people take control of their health and basically in turn, helping them, uh, get back control of their life. Ooh. Deep question. Very deep. <laughs> uh, what I would say simply start. Nice. Take a step. Um, with that step, make it sustainable, right? I mentioned earlier, probably don't make the list of 20 things that you want to improve on. Pick one. Pick one, incorporate it into your life, make it a habit, get good at it, and then pick another. Um, just start, make it sustainable, and do something. Something is more than nothing, and then make it consistent. Like I said, what you do more times than not, that's who you become. Um, and you'd be surprised if you just start and create good habits, 
those habits, that's just who you are. Like it's not a conscious decision throughout the day. It's just what you do. That's great stuff. That is great, Nick. Well, I appreciate your time. Um, you know, if people wanted to get in touch with you or uh, True North, what would where can they go to? Like website, social media, anything like that? Yeah, so our website is uh, truenorthperform.com. Um, you can find me at Nick, N-I-K, at truenorthperform.com. Um, if you're looking to reach any of the coaching staff, it's info at truenorthperform.com. Um, if there's anybody out there who thinks that they could benefit from a, just a good group of people who are just looking to get healthy, get fit, have a good time together, have the best hour of their day, really, um, in a no sweat environment, I highly encourage you to reach out. Um, we'd love to work with you. For sure. Like I told Kelly, uh, you know, you know, I'm a big fan of you guys and what you're, what you're doing over there. So I really appreciate your time and, uh, yeah, just thanks for coming on. Yeah. It's been an awesome time, man. All right, guys. And as always, thanks for listening to the Green Bay Health Project podcast. If you'd like more information about one of our guests or us at Movement Performance and Rehabilitation, just send us an email at info at mvmt-rehab.com. That's info at movement-rehab.com.